welcome to our uh, first edition, actually, of uh, Shifted Ed podcasts um, uh, that Learn Quebec has been doing over the last few years. Uh, this episode, I have um, some wonderful guests uh, that are going to uh, talk to us a little bit about coding and programming and the future thereof. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Brian Silverman and Artemis Popper to uh, Shifted Ed today. Um, hi, guys. How are you doing? Good. We're doing good. Excellent. Nice yeah, it's nice to hear from you guys. It's been a while that we haven't had a had a chat. And uh, I thought that it'd be really cool to kind of reach out to you guys and just uh, have a touch base on how the community uh, or community is doing. And uh, um, I, I thought that it would be really fun to kind of hear your guys perspectives a little bit on, um, you know, programming coding in in kind of our educational sphere. Um, but I kind of wanted to start off by asking you guys, I often get this question when I go into schools and when I'm talking with teachers of the difference between what coding and programming is. And I never really have a good answer. Do you guys have an answer for that? I don't think I have a good answer. I'm old enough that when I first saw a computer and did a first program, it, programming was the only word around. Right. At some level, I think it's just semantics. But yep. there's a lot of initiatives. They say coding for kids rather than programming for kids. Brian, you may yeah, want to say more. Yeah, more. you know, it, it's funny, though, because actually having two words for overlapping things is always a little bit of confusing, which I guess is why people are asking you that. Yeah. Well, I don't have a good definition. Here's a bad definition. <laughs> okay. um, some people, when they're grown ups, you ask what they do with their lives and they say, I'm a programmer. Right. Um, the activity that those guys are doing is programming. All other uses of programming, coding, scripting, pick any word you want, are not programming. So it may make sense to actually have one word to mean the professional skill and another word to mean the superpower that you get by knowing how to do it well. Oh, interesting. I like that. <laughs> but similarly, if you wanted to have another analogy about writing, you do writing, whether you are a Nobel Prize winner in, of literature, Pulitzer Prize winner of literature, well, what are you? You're a writer. You, you write poems just for yourself. And, you know, you're also a, a writer. So it's, you know, for writing, we don't have this, we don't have two words, one for the professional skill and one for the everyday hobby, exploring skill. Right. But for... For talking to a computer, telling the computer to do something, we have coding and we have programming, which I think it's an interesting thing culturally, how we evolved towards for that, but not for other things. Yeah, I, I hear you. So I can see if you're talking about programming or, or coding with students, you can interchange the two. I would. But yeah. Not everybody yeah, I kind of would, but um, you know, maybe a little bit later we should say that the people who are designing the experiences for kids should be pretty clear about the fact that there's two different things going on. Right, right, exactly. Interesting. So let's rewind a little bit, guys, to your first experiences. Now I know that you both have 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 been in the you know, tech sphere, stratosphere for, for quite a while um, in education and getting technology and integration and, um, you know, making education more adaptable to the modern day world tech wise. But think back to when you guys first were starting, what, what was the first exciting thing that you guys were doing with computers when you were first starting your journey? Um. So the thing is, is we've been at this for a long time, but that's balanced off by the fact that surprisingly we got old. So <laughs> when, when, when I was a kid, computers kind of weren't really in the, in the world for real people. You know, computers then were sort of like the space program now. 
something that lots of little kids were really enthusiastic about, but it was kind of distant. You'd kind of see it in science fiction and films and, you know, documentaries and things, mm -hmm. you know, but the whole notion of actually having access to a computer was pretty foreign. And that, you know, actually having access to computers is something that like in my life only started when I was like 18 or 19 or so. Right. Right. And what were what were the kinds of first things you were doing, Brian, with your computer when you got it at 18, 19? Like what oh, were... no. the first time I got a computer, I was like 24 or 25. Okay. The first experiences that I had with the computer, there's some early pre-experiences. I have an older brother, Barry, who is he's about two years older than me. Mm -hmm. And he went off to school and he started taking computer classes. And when he'd come home for holidays, you know, he would show me his like introduction to Fortran books. And I thought they were <laughs> intriguing in a way that I would not find intriguing now. Yeah. And it turned out that Barry managed to, cons my father at the time was working with a real estate company. Barry managed to convince the real estate company to use computers to help sell houses. Mm. So um, the company put together a system where nothing that would be surprising now, but it was really surprising back in the early 70s. You'd say, I'd like a three-bedroom house in Chamity in the $15,000 price range. And mm -hmm. back in those years, that price range actually wasn't stupid. It was like the way, where things were. Right. So um, Barry got involved with the company, putting the, the code together. And I ended up getting a summer job or two and following along. So mm -hmm. the first experiences I had in programming was data entry for a real estate company where wow. um, the system happened to run an, a crude version of basic and also a language called a, a programming language. Um, mm -hmm. I can say a bit more, but let's, Artemis first for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, first time I saw a computer was, uh, well, first time I remember seeing a computer I was 10 years old. I was at the uh, artificial intelligence building at MIT with my father. And uh, he showed me there, I think it was the top floor where there was this huge floor filled with computers. Right. And the computer was as big as a refrigerator each. <laughs> and there were, I think there were different machines. Maybe it was one whole big machine. I can't even remember, but it was like air conditioned because otherwise the thing would overheat and <laughs> overheat and melt away. It was um, it was a big thing. And then on the, the other floors, there was those terminals where you could type things and it would somehow communicate up there. Because at the time <laughs> I had no clue, you know, about more details than that. Right. And the language I was, uh, you know, that those machines, machines used, I mean, the machines I was shown, I was shown the logo programming language back then. Mm, great. What was that Artemis, the logo programming? Like, because I think a lot of, a lot of teachers and students, they they might've heard of it, but could you, t like, what, what was the logo a premise? Like what was its main functioning um, as a, as an operating system? So the idea was at the time there was no, there was nothing like, you know, hour of code, coding for children. The idea that the child could use a computer was like completely considered total science fiction. Right. Happened to be Cynthia Solomon, Seymour Papert, and uh, Danny Fortoy that decided, you know, having a programming language for children, hmm. that would be something good to do. So they worked on making something that at the time in the 60s, what Seymour Papp would like to say is he wanted a language that was simple enough for a five-year-old to use and powerful enough for a professional programmer to use. Hmm. Happens yeah. at the time, it wasn't totally stupid to think of a language that could fit those two poles. Now it's the complexity of professional programming became so complex that it's way harder to have something that uh, that is uh, you know can spawn bo both both uh, both ends of the spectrum but at the time it was logo started before there was screens for the computers were all, all done by teletype it was uh, you were you printed on sheets of paper and mm. Logo became to be known for the turtle and turtle geometry. Right. But at the beginning, beginning, it was more or less manipulations. 
Great. And then afterwards, the, the first thing that came being able to draw for, with Logo was what we call the floor turtles. Right. So it was big things on wheels attached by a table to a computer, to a machine. And they had a pen, real pen in there. Yeah. Yeah. And they could draw with the pen touching the paper that was put on the floor. Or they could put their pen up, hence the pen up command in a lot of blocks languages today, and move without leaving a trace. Right. Right. And you know, the things, a lot of things that were being done at the time was a lot of geometrical patterns. And that was, you know, something that a lot of children found uh, exciting and interesting. Right. It's it's interesting too that, I mean, when I work with students as well, we do something similar now in Scratch um, that has kind of brought that to its next level. Um, and also with your turtle art, um, which we've played with with tons of students where you're actually, you need a screen, but um, it's doing, you know, it's creating forms and shapes through um, through code, which... I, I always thought when I brought it into students that, oh, this might be too complicated. And to my surprise, I could bring it into a grade one class, your turtle art. And I would get kids creating these things that were just outstanding um, with very, very little instruction. Um, they were just seemed to able to just pick it up. Brian, could you talk a little bit to that about when you guys first we're bringing out turtle art and, and the response that it got, because it, it is that evolution from logo, correct? Well, um, would it be okay if I continue to answer the last question? First? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, um, this is very consistent with what you're saying in that if the thing that you're doing is about programming, about coding, then it's less exciting than if the thing that you're doing is being engaged in some project for which coding or programming is the material rather than the end. Right. 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 So um, when you asked about my you know, first experiences with this, the things yeah. that I mentioned, it, it really then it was just about itself. The first two projects that I did were um, the last one that I did up on my father's computer is we implemented Conway's game, game of Life. And very, very interesting thing. You, you look it up, it says that there's all sorts of stuff about it. Okay. And then I went off to school and um, I wanted to take a computer programming class. And it turned out that the only one that was easily available was in Fortran. Hmm. So um, when I told my friends who all worked at the Logo Lab that I was taking a Fortran course, when they stopped laughing, they <laughs> suggested that what we should do is there's an extension of tic-tac-toe, which is like polar tic-tac-toe. They suggest that they'll write their program in Logo and I'll write my program in Fortran and we can play them against each other. <laughs> <laughs> now, it turned out that uh, the Logo gag won, but it was outnumbered three to one, so it wasn't really that. But, but um, after that, after that, many projects that I did were were in Logo because all my friends work in Logo Labs. So, um, you know, was the, was Fortran's life very short lived? No, like, no, Fortran in my life it was, but Fortran came out in '59 and it's still being used by scientists everywhere. Oh. Wow. You know, the, you know, Fortran is, you know, it's kind of the lingua franca of, of big models in science. Okay. You okay. know, so, you know, it, it never really went away, but it, it, it very different domain. But, um, you know, tur the beginnings of turtle art is um, what I think, and, you know, Artemis actually had a, a real role in this. Um, Logo was about a lot of things, but one of the things it was about that it wasn't solely about was um, making art with code. So mm -hmm. what we did with Turtle Art is rather than trying to make a, a bit of software that could be anything, we decided instead to make a bit of software that was something. And that particular something was really focused on static two-dimensional images that are of um, artistic value, at least to the creator. Mm -hmm. So when Brian first showed me turtle art, he said, you know, I wanted to bring back turtle geometry because I've been rereading the AI memos and they were, they are just great. great. So I wanted to create something that could 
bring those back to life again. Mm -hmm. So he shows me total art and then he said, you know, with my colleague Paula Bonta, it's we're not quite sure if it's about math, about geometry, about, about art. After using the software for 10 minutes, I said, what a dumb question. <laughs> it's obviously about art. What else do you want it to be about? Right. Right. But then I'm an artist. <laughs> So, you know, and I use total art for a lot of my artwork yep. and I see it and there's a big debate in the art world. If you're using, if you're using codes or programming, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. is it real art? And I want to tell those people, look, when I use a brush and acrylic paint, it's about art. It's not about the acrylic and the brush. Yes, of course, the acrylic the medium I'm using will allow me to do certain things I can do in acrylic that I cannot do in watercolor or with pastels or with crayons. But, you know, it's still art. It's still, still me, the artist, making all the artistic decisions. It's not the paint making the decisions for me. Right, absolutely. But the same thing when I use code for doing artwork, I'm making the decisions. Right, right. And Artemis, tell me a little bit about you were doing art before you were like, how did your art and, and programming kind of get fused? Was it when turtle art was, was, was becoming, or had you had prior experiences where you brought art mediums and, and computers together? No, I had had, um, as a child, I had used the on and off uh, log, uh, logo, mm -hmm. but at the time, the, the displays were really very crude. The, you know, one day we had this big revolution. You could have eight colors on the screen or something. Mm. And the resolution of the screen was like, you know, you could see the pixels that were nearly, you know, millimeters by millimeter square. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but right, it's, right. it's uh, and the log, and I guess because of the limitations of the technology or whatever, the logo culture wasn't really about art. And that, you know, Total Art appeared and I was there that that's the logo I always would have wanted to have, but for mm -hmm. technical reasons, we couldn't have it back then. Right, right. So that's when I started using uh, computers for making, uh, for making uh, art. Right. And I still use, uh, you know, classical pa paint and... Uh, sure. And have you ever fused those two together where you have a piece of a work that's that's programmed and the other is is you know using paint or pastels or charcoals or have you ever fused those two together i haven't really fused them but there's some some images i did one of the very first total art images i did i wanted to try to see if i could reproduce on the screen something that had the same texture as strokes of paint on the canvas hmm. so i have an image that you know the paint on canvas and its rendition in turtle art. Wow. That's really interesting. Really interesting. Brian, let me ask you this. I always talk when I'm talking with teachers about that eventually the technology becomes invisible. How would you respond to that? Like, do you, do you get that idea of that the tool eventually just becomes the tool and it, it's the purpose becomes really the forefront of things? Um, let me just have what I respond to it. Yes, the technology, the goal of the technology should be to disappear. Um, this, Seymour Papert used to like telling this story that um, one of the first times they gave kids lots of time with computers in classrooms, he said in the first month or two, he'd visit and he'd ask kid, what are you doing? And the kid would say, I'm working with the computer. And mm -hmm. Then um, after another couple of months, he'd stop and say, what are you doing? The kids would say, I'm programming in Logo. And then a little bit after that, he'd visit and the kids would say something like, I'm working on my skeleton project. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if you, um, when we're doing turtle art images, the fact that it's on a computer or that it's with code is the furthest thing from our mind. Right. Yeah, I love that. Those are some good, uh, good points for sure. 
When you um, write, you don't think about the paper on the pen anymore. Yeah, or Microsoft Word, though. Microsoft Word keeps popping up and calling <laughs> your attention. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, for sure. For sure. So bringing it back maybe a little bit in more depths into the educational system, why is it important for programming and education? I mean, Quebec seems to be lagging a little bit behind other provinces where they're actually making a conscious decision of bringing programming in. Um, why is that important in, in 2021 to, that all kids are exposed to this form of, of literacy, really? Um, so how, why is it important? There's yeah. been a debate in education that's lasted maybe five years, maybe 2000 years about um, <laughs> learning through didactic means versus, <clears throat> versus a project approach to learning. One of the things that computers and coding allow you to do is provide a project approach to math and science in a way that isn't really possible without them. So what the what the real the real reason that it's important is a lot of us yeah you know, I think everybody in this call believes that a project approach to education is what we should be going for, mm -hmm. and if you're buying into a project approach, you could push it further in the maths and sciences if you have computational power. Right, right. I think that too is one of the trickier parts for for some teachers, particularly in our math and our science, where it's very content oriented. Have have a difficulty seeing how they can integrate it into a, a class where they where they know they have to cover certain amounts of materials. Um, what would what what would your 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 replies be to a science teacher saying, "Yeah, programming just I don't have time for it. Doesn't fit in science." What would be your retort to a to a comment like that? <laughs> depending on how polite I was feeling. Uh, <laughs> it, it may be you don't have time to not do it. It may be that if what you're trying to do is, is get kids to get, it, get a feeling for the process of science, they should wander around any science lab and see what people are doing that minute. Right. Right. And the answer mm -hmm. is probably for a fair chunk of them, um, what they're doing is something to do with computation. You, you you keep mentioning computation, and I lo I love the idea of computational thinking. And um, can you guys give a little Cole's note on what is computational thinking? Like, wh what's the basis of that? Like, and why is that something that should be on education's radar? You know, it's funny though because um, you're asking the question about computational thinking, and I think I said computation rather than computational thinking, because the phrase computational thinking has been having a definition that's been bounced around, and a lot of people are using it to mean a lot of different things. Right now, for computation, if I could be so bold, um, computation is to the 21st century what mathematics was to the 20th century, hmm. as in. Um, Mathematics was a descriptive language for describing all sorts of things in math itself and in science. Computation is kind of a superset of that. It's mathematics, it, a representational system as powerful as mathematics with a better established notion of time. Now, I don't know if the question is, is what I would say to the math teacher, or if I said to the school principal who said, we don't have time to teach computation, you know, I'd say, well, it's simple replace the math curriculum <laughs> great great what would what would that look like like if um, we push that one step further like what how would that practically look like if we well for little kids it would probably look like the environments that were described by papert and solomon in their early logo memos mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's, it's again, this is getting back to a point we touched on just a few minutes ago. The real um, change in thinking is moving from a knowledge based approach to more of a project approach. Right. Yeah. right. So what it would look like is kids working on projects that were idea rich. Yes. Yes. And the other thing you hear, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic now, and you hear on the news reports, you know, we had a uh, the model we have about, you know, if we do this, the results will be that. If we do this, the model we have about, you know, how many hospital beds are going to be taken, how many mm -hmm. people are going to get infected, and whatever, you know. 
the models didn't just you know, come out of thin air. Someone sat in front of a computer, put some data in the computer, got the computer to do some, some the number crunching and came out with a solution. Right. If yeah. you know, if you had some experience yourself about having done anything even remotely similar with a computer, you know that, you know, you, you know, it's not, you know, there's not any magic, pure magic to it. You know, there's something, some rational thinking behind it. There's some, you know, it's going to be as your model is going to be as good as the people doing the model are going to be. Right, right, right. It, and I it, think it makes, a, makes people more informed citizens or give the people the power to be more informed citizens. Right. Even right. if, you know, I don't have myself the skills to do all that, at least I can have the skills to have some about critical thinking about the mm -hmm. whatever is given to me. Okay. This I know I can go and get more information about. Right, right. This, yeah, because I know I need to trust the person doing it because it's way beyond what I'll be able to learn in any sensible amount of time. Okay, what are the hints that, okay, yes, I can trust you. It's okay. I'll believe what you're telling me. Mm -hmm. Or no, I don't trust you because, you know, there's something that, you know, doesn't quite seem sensible to me. Right, right. Do you think that um, um, all students are capable of, of programming? Like, I mean, is it a universal skill that all students should be able to access? Um, maybe the right answer to that is we should think of it as the fourth R. Hmm. And um, I'm just saying the fourth R that's got as many R's in it as reading and writing, right? Right. right. Sorry, Re reading and arithmetic, writing and arithmetic. Right. The thing is, is if you ask the question of are all, cap are all students capable of the previous three R's, you know, I'm not sure what the right answer is. Is at a younger age, absolutely. Um, when you move into more advanced levels, you know, the kids who are into it may do better than the kids that aren't. But, you know, at, you know, at a simple level, you know, yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. should be exposed to it. Is right. it going to be to everybody's taste? That's a different question. Right. Is it large enough, though, that we can get a vast variety of students into programming like is it it's expansive enough to be able that everybody can find an avenue into it do you think that that's a um a legitimate statement well it's more like um is the category of projects that we'd like kids to be working on that would benefit by having some you know computational enhancement broad enough that there's something for everybody you know i think to that i'd say yes right, yeah, right. i agree with that hmm yeah, it kind of brings me like, I'm not, I don't remember the date of it, but I remember um, Seymour and Cynthia, I believe, remember they put that um, 20 thing or 10 things to do with a computer back oh, 20 or 20 things. things? Yeah. I, it, it, Gary Steger just came out with a volume with um, a re reprint of the paper and dozens and dozens commentary on it, commentaries on it. Right. And do you think that those projects that were presented in that paper, I think it, I, I don't know, or I don't remember the date, but I know it was like 60s, 70s around there. Um, it was uh, 50 years ago. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it was 50 years ago. Yeah, well, no, I think it was 72 because I think Gary wanted to have the book out for the 50th anniversary. What was right. really funny is um, through the 80s and 90s and all those, we kept tracking how many of those 20 things became possible. And mm -hmm. I think at this point in time, all of them, right. but it's all like back in the mid eighties, it was only like a third of them. So, you know, technology is marching on. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing that we need to be aware of what's out there, but also um, not get too overwhelmed by it all because of, of the rapidness of, of change in technology. Um, it seems like there's a new thing out there every school year. Um, rather than just kind of keeping it focused on project-based and using it again as a tool. Well, using the... 
Yeah, because I think the consistency, the thing that's been consistent of all of it is is the educational philosophy, the idea of learning by doing and um, mm-hmm. being engaged in meaningful projects. I think that's been constant. You know, what the technology has done is it, it's, you know, changed the category of interesting projects for a particular point in time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's super fascinating. Um, I just want to thank you guys for for taking a bit of time and and sharing some thoughts. Um, I've, every time I do these, these um, podcasts with, with um, our community, I, I, I leave with a ton more questions and thoughts and ideas. So I really appreciate your, uh, both of you, your words. Um, and I, I just want to thank you. Um, and I hope that uh, we see each other soon. And um, that you both have a wonderful holiday season and a great new year. Um, and it's been really, um, a pleasure kind of exploring this idea of, of programming in, in education with you guys. And my final, um, question I'd love to, um, if we put our, our hats of the future on, where do you see all this going? Um, if you had to pull your crystal ball out, where, where are we going with, 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 um, technology and education and programming and where do you think we're going to end up I know that artificial intelligence is coming in and um, there's always something new on the horizon but what do you guys what do you see of the future um, I've got a quote Alan Kay our you know, wonderful friend who said the best way of predicting the future is by inventing it <laughs> and uh, if I wanted to predict the future without our inventions I would kind of think that um, coding has been the flavor of the month for about as long as flavors of the month last. And artificial intelligence is in, it's moving in to be the newer flavor, flavor of the month. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been at this um, even before coding had become super popular. And it was really coding as the, the appropriate way of, of arguing for a project approach to education and i so where are we going to go in the future is we're continue to try to promote a project approach to education and to do project approach the hour of something what can you really do in one hour (laughs) if you have a collection of one hours and preferably one hours that are adjacent to each other so you have chunks of four or five hours Mm-hmm. Then you can start maybe doing something that has more, you know, more meaning and more depth to it. Yeah, I love that. Of one hour, you know, it's what you can do in that is pretty limited. Right. It's like you have one hour of guitar playing and then you have to play a show. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, that might well be a you wait tricky. another year before you do <laughs> right. a hour of guitar right. or of writing or of cookie or anything yeah yeah no that's perfect that's perfect well thank you guys again i really appreciate it and um have a great uh, holiday season and the best to you and your your family same to you too and to the listeners and thank you for having us oh it was wonderful thanks so much